us. And these bank runs happen faster than anyone can contemplate. Now, what did uh, so? So the vulnerabilities in the in between, who are they? These are banks that have between roughly two hundred billion and nine hundred billion of assets. <laughs> Yeah, I think with banks, you have to sort of take a three-tiered approach. There are, there are small community banks that are actually very sound. I, I do some of my banking with a bank that was founded in um, 1877. I figure, all right, you made, you made it through the panic of 1907, the panic of 1898, the Great Depression, uh, the Keeling crisis, long-term capital, Russia, uh, continental Illinois, you made it through all that, so you must be doing something right. Um, and uh, yeah, like, yeah, look at the balance sheet, do your homework, but some of those banks are, are just fine. Then there are the banks that are absolutely positively too big to fail. I mean, the technical term is globally systemic, important GSI institutions, and we know who they are. It's JP Morgan Chase, Citi, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo, Truist, he's a dopey name, but Truist, uh, and, and there, there are a couple others on the list. And they are absolutely too big to fail, which doesn't mean the stock price can go, does can't go down. See, that's the thing. If you're if you're a depositor, yeah, you care about bank failures, you care about FDIC insurance and so forth. If you're a creditor, note holder, you care about all this stuff. But if you're a stockholder, you can lose a lot of money in a bank that does not fail, just because the the equity takes a beating. But the real vulnerability is in between, not the little guys who've been around and who pass. Uh, by the way, a, a ratio that very few people look at that has become very important in determining the soundness of a bank. Look at the ratio of insured deposits to total deposits. Because deposits over $250,000 are not insured. Now, there's a whole bunch of technical. You can have two accounts, and you and your wife can have separate accounts, and you can go to separate banks. There are ways to get that insured balance up into the millions if you read the fine print on the FDIC website. But it's, 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 a, it's a lot of work, and do read the fine print. But as a heuristic, as a rule of thumb, uh, $250,000 per account uh, in the same bank is the ceiling on uh, deposit insurance. Well, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, which failed in March 2023, their insured deposits were 3%. They were 97% uninsured deposits, including all the Silicon Valley startups, uh, but some big companies as well. Cisco had an account there. One of the big uh, Bitcoin uh, custodians had an account there. They kept their cash there. Um, some of these accounts were in the billions of dollars. They were not insured. And so if there's a run on a bank and b before the regulators even get out of bed, you know, depositors are taking their money out. Um, and it's not, we all remember, you know, grainy black and white pictures from the 1930s of guys in overcoats and fedoras lined up around the bank trying to get their money before the doors closed, and usually they didn't. But uh, the, the 21st century equivalent of that is someone, I don't have a cell phone, <laughs> with a cell phone, doing an online withdrawal, sending it to another account, and then and texting their friends, hey, get your money out now, happening at the speed of light and with exponential impact, uh, a little faster than word of mouth. It's like word of uh, text. Well, uh, to your point, uh, Sean, and, you know, look, the, <clears throat> pardon me, the ticker changes all the time, but I just took a glanced at it. It's actually 2470. Uh, you're right. It, it, it got to the 2400 level and sustained that. You're absolutely right. It was 2470, which is, I think, a tick from the all-time high. It might actually be the all-time high uh, if it's if it's a closing price. I think it was an intraday. It might have been 2470. Well, that's basically all-time high. Um, and my view is um, that tells you almost nothing about gold, and it tells you a lot about the dollar. When I see a higher dollar price for gold, I don't say, oh, gee, gold's going up. What I say is, hey, the dollar's crashing. Now, you don't see that in cross rates. You don't see it against the euro, the Swiss franc, uh, Japanese yen, Chinese yuan, uh, the Bloomberg dollar index, DXY, which the Wall Street Journal uses. You look at every single one of those, and the dollar is very strong. Uh, you know, the yen, I, I debate internally, it was, oh, the yen will never get to 150. It, it, it hit 160. Remind people, when I started the banking business, the yen was 400. So I've, I've seen I've seen this movie before. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the double-digit yen is not a, uh, a in stone, so to speak. Uh, uh, so so yen 160 didn't surprise me. But you say, well, Jim, isn't the dollar strong? The indices are up. The other currencies are down. The cross rates favor the dollar, et cetera, et cetera. 
The answer is yes, if that's your measuring stick. But all you're doing is comparing one central bank currency to another central bank currency. But think of them all as survivors in a lifeboat with no food or water. I mean, they're all going down together. The point is, that's not the best way to measure dollar strength because, all, all your, yeah, I can see a preference for the dollar over the euro. I can think, given a war in Ukraine, I can think of 100 reasons why that's true. Same thing with the yuan. The Chinese economy is imploding. I could favor dollars over yuan. But those are all cross rates, currency to currency. They don't tell you very much to the extent that there are common factors in all central bank currencies. If you want to know what the dollar is doing, look at gold. Gold, I'll say silver, but silver is kind of a tag along. So let's talk about gold. Gold uh, and silver are the only forms of money that are not also forms of debt. Right. Take a, take a twenty dollar bill out of your wallet and read it. It's, it's actually a contract between the government and the people. And I, was, I know in law school they always said read the contract. So I read the contract. It says at the top, Federal Reserve note. Note is debt. Um, and go to the Fed website. Look at the balance sheet. Where's the Where's M1 or M0 or any or currency? It's on the liability side, which is a form of debt. Uh, and that's not like an earth shaking revolution. But most people think of it as an asset. Well, it might be your asset, but it's their debt. Uh, it's government debt. <clears throat> Treasury knows it's government debt, uh, even though they're very liquid and you can, you can sell them and you can sell them to the Fed and get cash. Um, so all forms of money are forms of debt. Uh, and debt and credit, two sides of the same coin, are the key to commerce and, uh, and mercantile success, et cetera. Um, but, uh, but gold is not. Gold is, is a form of money, the best form in my view, but it's not a form of debt. So it has that kind of purity, no pun intended, as a yardstick, as a measuring rod, because you're not measuring with the same thing. You're using something different to measure the object. And so, again, gold at an all-time high, I say, fine. Dollars at an all-time low, um, and that—that's kind of a wake-up call for people who keep talking about strong dollar, strong dollar. Because you know, there's that old uh, uh, 1969 live performance in Montreux Jazz Festival. The song was called "Compared to What," and uh, <laughs> great song. When people used to say, "Is the dollar stronger? How's the dollar doing?" I, I say, "Compared to what?" You know, if, against the euro, uh, against the yuan, yeah, very strong. Against gold, not so much. So. Um, so I would expect gold to go higher because I would expect the dollar to continue to weaken as the U.S. Uh, uh, debt exceeds $35 trillion, as the U.S. debt to GDP ratio exceeds 130%, highest in history. If you said 130% debt to GDP ratio, you know, government debt's the numerator, GDP's the denominator, over 130%, who's at that lunch table? The answer is Lebanon, Greece, and uh, and our friends in Italy is basically the biggest super debtors in the world. And then Japan, of course, is 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 in detention. They're like they're, they're like, they're like uh, 300 percent or something. Um, uh, sorry, over 200 percent. Everyone says, does that mean the dollar collapses tomorrow? And the answer is no. It doesn't mean the dollar collapses tomorrow. It doesn't mean the treasury market collapses tomorrow. I say, what if the Chinese stop buying? No big deal. Just call J Jamie Dimon and say, Jamie, shoot him, and you know. The, the banks will do what they're told. They've been trained. It, it doesn't mean the end of the dollar or the end of the treasury market, but it is indicative of much slower growth at best. Again, you can still have your technical recessions within a long, what's called a long depression. I would say, uh, and others agree that Japan has been in a recession, sorry, a depression, has been in a depression since 1989. Yeah. Now they've had nine technical recessions you know, they can't get out of it. Uh, they can't get out of the rut. Uh, they've had nine technical recessions over those uh, uh, 30 years, 30 plus years. Um, I'm sorry, I guess 35 years at this point. Um, nine technical recessions, but one very long depression. I would say the United States has been in a depression since 2007. Mm -hmm. Now we've had uh, one uh, severe technical recession in 2008, 2009. We had a recession that's not a recession. Don't call it a recession, said Janet Yellen. In the first two quarters of 2022, we had two consecutive quarters of declining GDP in the first half of 2022. Why was that not a recession? Because Janet Yellen said, don't call it a recession. And the National Bureau of Economic Research, which are the umpires, you know, uh, they call the balls of strength. They, they haven't said so. So, okay, I guess it never happened, but the data is you, your GDP went down two quarters in a row. So count that as a mild a mini recession. 
but it's been one long depression, uh, particularly the episode from 2009 to 2019 when compound annual growth over that 11-year period was 2.2%. This, this is an economy that has potential to grow 3.5%. When you grow 2.2% in a world of 3.5% potential, that's depressed growth. Uh, by the way, that delta between 35 and 2.2, it's, it's uh, approaching $9 trillion of lost wealth if we had had policies, including a, lo- a lower deficits that would have uh, allowed that to happen. So we're trying to borrow away out of a debt trap. It never works. The long-term result can be, probably will be hyperinflation, but we're not there yet. Um, but what we should expect is exactly what we're getting, which is slow growth at best and periodic recessions at worst. And I think we're probably in a recession uh, right now. So what does that mean for, for gold? Well, weaker dollar uh, measured in gold means a higher dollar price for gold. Central banks are net buyers, have been since 2010. That's continuing. Um, Americans don't get gold. They, you know, we're, we're now into a third generation of people who have been taught nothing about gold in a monetary context. I always tell people, if you know anything about uh, gold, uh, you, either, uh, you either went to mining college or you're self-taught, but, um, but we stopped teaching it. So it's not surprising that even, you know, quote unquote, well-educated Americans don't understand gold. Uh, it's routinely ridiculed on, you know, financial TV and elsewhere. But meanwhile, it goes its own way. And I think it's higher and, you know, 2,500 is just a, uh, is, uh, Mick Jagger said, this is shout, just a shot away. So, um, but I would expect it to be on its way to 3,000 sooner than later. The other thing, quick piece of, uh, I always try to keep the math at the sixth grade level. There's rarely any need to go higher uh, in, in terms of calculus or whatever, but people focus on the dollar increases in the price of gold. It went up $100 an ounce or over time, it went up $500 an ounce, et cetera. And that's fine, and that's real money, and that's your gain. But as the dollar price gets higher, each dollar increase represents a smaller percentage gain. So, for example, if gold goes from $2,000 to $3,000 an ounce, that's a 50% increase. But if it goes from $9,000 to $10,000 an ounce, that's an 11% increase. Still a thousand bucks. You made a thousand dollars an ounce on your uh, on your gold stash or your gold position or whatever. It's real money, but it gets easier uh, because the percentage gain is smaller as the denominator of the fraction increases. So what that means is this is how you get this is how you get bubbles. We're nowhere near a bubble in gold, but if it gets to the blow off bubble stage, we'll we'll kind of keep an eye out for that down the road. But going to three thousand, four thousand, five thousand, six thousand dollars an ounce, each thousand dollar jump. It's easier than the one before because it's a smaller percentage jump. It goes from 50% to 30% to 20% to down to 10% or, or less. And so the time to get the gold is now before, before the rocket ship really takes off. So these bank runs happen faster than anyone can contemplate. Now, what did, uh, so, so the vulnerabilities in the in-between, who are they? These are banks that have between roughly 200 billion and 900 billion of assets, so it's not J.P. Morgan, but it's not my local bank either. I actually don't want to mention names. They're pretty easy to find the list, but uh, everyone knows who they are. I don't want to start running any banks, but I would look at a double metric. I would look at uh, 200 billion to 900 billion in total assets and a insured deposit to total deposit ratio of under 30%. If, if that's who you are, you are extremely vulnerable, and those are the banks I would get my money out of. Even though they're not technically too big to fail, they're not classified as GSIs globally, uh, systemically important, the Fed's not going to let them fail in terms of depositors, but they will let them crash and burn in terms of stockholders. And that stock can go to zero even if the depositors are bailed out. Now, what actually happened in Silicon Valley Bank, it wasn't just Silicon Valley Bank. It was um, Silvergate Bank, Silicon Valley Signature Bank, with Barney, Barney Frank on the board, by the way, uh, our, our friendly bank uh, regulator from the House of Representatives at the time, and then um, Credit Suisse, one of the largest, oldest banks in the world, and First Republic, which is one of the largest asset managers around. They failed in pretty close sequence, four of them within three weeks or less, and then the fifth one fell about a month and a half later. But what did the Fed and the FDIC do to stop that uh, cascade of bank failures? They guaranteed every deposit in the system. They said, forget about the $250,000. 
we're guaranteeing everybody. They didn't they didn't do that at first, by the way, with Silicon Valley. Friday night they said two fifty is the limit. Uh if you're over that, we're giving you as a certificate basically. The, the the bank had been taken over, placed in custodianship, and that we'll give you a custodian certificate and we'll get back to you on what it's worth. We gotta sell the assets first or do a merge or something. We'll get back to you. But it was illiquid. You didn't know what it was worth and you didn't know when you were gonna get paid. But your deposit was gone. That was kind of what the G7 said in Brisbane in 2014. That was the bail-in, not the bail-out. 48 hours later, they said, just kidding. Uh, all the deposits are insured. Uh, no limit. You know, it was, you know, Bill Ackman, all the Silicon Valley crybabies ran to the White House and they got what they wanted. But they did something else. The Fed created a facility that said to every bank, if you own U.S. Treasury securities, you can uh, borrow the face value from us Give us the securities as collateral. We'll give you the cash, a one-year loan. I'm sure the interest rate was like 1% or something like that. Regardless of the fact that the securities were only worth 70 cents on the dollar. Because a lot of the securities had been bought when interest rates were one and a half, two 2%, and in the meantime, interest rates had gone to 5.5%, those bonds were way underwater, depending on the maturity, down 20 to 30%. And the feds, and if you marked them to market, those banks would clearly have been insolvent. The Fed said, again, never mind, we'll give you 100 cents on the dollar, even if the bonds are only worth 70 cents on the dollar. I, I tried to find someone at the Fed I could call and see if they would take my used car on the same uh, same math, but uh, it was unsuccessful. That that facility got to be several, several hundred billion dollars in a very short period of time, which shows how illiquid a lot of these banks were. Here's my question, Sean. When the bank crisis comes back, and I would say it never really went away, but you know we're at a we're in a timeout, half time. We're in the locker rooms. So we're going to get back on the field. When this reemerges, there'll be some catalyst for it and it could be a lot of things. What else have they got in their bag of tricks? I mean, once you've guaranteed every treasury bond, regardless of market value, and you've guaranteed every bank deposit, regardless of the, the, the deposit amount, the deposit insurance, what else can you do? Well, the answer is you can nationalize the banks. Um, but that means wiping out the stockholders. And so, uh, again, if you're a depositor, I personally wouldn't take chances, but you may get by as they did in Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, if you're a bondholder, get ready for a haircut. And if you're a stockholder, get ready to be wiped out because um, that's that's what will happen. 